Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage the chairman of the Games for Change board, Asi Barak. This year, uh, we have a range of talks, uh, virtual reality, neurogaming, uh, health applications that you can follow. Um, and I decided to start with a conversation with a brain scientist that is not from gaming. Um, and I have with me today Kevin Oxner. He's the head of the Social Cognitive Neuroscience Lab at Columbia University. And we're going to have a conversation about the big picture and where this uh, sector is going to. And of course, we'll talk about games as well. Kevin? So the secret is that we already talked before a bit, because otherwise I wouldn't know even what to ask you. Um, but, uh, but let's start from the basics. So you know, the reason I think we're having this conversation is because there's a, whole, a lot of hype, I would say, in the last two, three years. And um, a lot of uh, scientists are looking into games. And it's almost like to take someone from outside of this sector that doesn't know much about games for change and you know, to do the, this kind of, uh, at least objective from your point of view, look at what we're doing. So the, the most basic question would be, if neurogaming needs to work, right? If our assumption is that you could affect change with neurogaming, the brain needs to change, right? And what, what can you tell us about you know, this idea that the brain changes, uh, also <coughs> maybe in, in more like historic perspective, like how did, people thought about it 10, 20 years ago versus now? Sure, so that's a, that's a great question. It's a pleasure to be here. So um, there was a dogma up until about the 1980s that the brain, when you're an adult, doesn't really change very much. Sure, you learn, but the brain was not thought to be tremendously plastic. Have you ever been to a neurologist? A lot of the times what they're doing is they're just diagnosing a problem, but they don't really have any treatments to help you if you've got a problem that's due to a deficit or damage to your central nervous system, to your brain, to your spinal cord, and so on. And to a certain extent, that's still true. Um, but starting in the 80s, late 80s, early 90s, there was a revolution in the way we thought about the plasticity of the brain. And suddenly we realized that the brain, in many ways, was very much like a muscle where there is experience-dependent plasticity, where um, you could see at the level of individual neurons changes in the branching of connections between two different neurons as a function of your environment. And this started off initially with experiments um, in rodents, in mice, and rats, where they have mice live in an enriched environment. They've got like little running wheels and gymnastics apparatus and kind of colorful things to look at and jump through and chase each other through as compared to kind of the stark cage with nothing in it. And what you find is that various parts of the brain would show incredible differentiation in the connections between neurons. It's not that you were growing new neurons. That's not how change happens in the brain as a function of learning. It's the connections between neurons. And that was followed by great interest in human research um, that really didn't get underway until the 90s when a technique called functional uh, magnetic resonance imaging. You may have heard of this as MRI for short. Uh, functional MRI allows us to look at the function of the brain, which parts of your brain are getting more blood flow. Structural MRI looks like this black and white picture of the inside of your head. And um, we can now do really careful analyses of changes in the microstructure of your brain and the connections between parts of your brain. And so we now know, for example, that um, let's say you take a job as a taxi driver. There's a really well-known study done of London taxi cab drivers where um, London taxi cab drivers over some number of weeks, um, they have to learn, in order to become a taxi driver there, you have to be able to pass tests on a street map of London. And so if you uh, track these people over time longitudinally, you can find that there's a structure in your brain that's incredibly important for learning these kinds of associations, um, kind of novel associations, uh, navigating a space, creating a kind of cognitive map of the space. It's called the hippocampus. Hippocampus means uh, seahorse. And the Greeks named structures of your brain for the objects in the real world that they physically resembled. So this part of your brain, it's buried beneath your temporal lobe. Lobes of the brain are named for the bones of the skull under which they lie. It's buried deep inside your brain there. The, hi the hippocampus actually gets thicker because of the differentiation of connections among nerve cells. Um, and it actually changes. It gets bigger. It's just like a muscle. It's like you're doing curls 
for your hippocampus by becoming a London taxi cab driver. You can have people be trained to be meditators, where they follow their breath periodically over time. There have been longitudinal studies that have shown that if you become a meditator that's following your breath, focusing on internal states, parts of your brain that have an internal map, or have a map of your internal viscera, what is your body doing, what are your lungs doing, what is your heart doing, those become thicker as a function of that training. And so there's a lot that we now know about structural changes in the brain. We now know that it's incredibly plastic. We know that exercise, physical exercise, puts kind of in motion. It creates a pla an environment in, of, for the brain where there are kind of like nerve growth, neural growth factors. It's one way to think about it. It creates an environment where behavioral things you then do can kind of take root to a greater extent. Right. So, so, so this is a good segue to the next, uh, to the next area. In one of our earlier conversations, I mentioned um, some of the talks that we're going to hear today and tomorrow. And one of them is the idea that um, people are now experimenting and developing games with the goal to get FDA approval. So you'll hear about it from Adam Gazelli and others, but the idea of digital medicine, that games in real time and over time can actually achieve uh, changes um, which is almost like cognitive training, right? That uh, they can uh, deal with deficits, they can deal. And in one of our earlier conversations, you said, well, it's not surprising. While when I'm telling that story to people outside of our sector, they think it's science fiction, that you know, one day a doctor will prescribe a game to play every day instead of taking pills. Um, well, I can say a lot about doctors who give you pills. Um, uh, and maybe that's actually a good way to start responding to that. Um, so if you want to change behavior, the best way to change behavior um, is to try to create an environment that models the appropriate behavior and kind of successively rewards and leads people towards the behavior you want them to engage in. This is one of the reasons why psychiatry has had such a hard time trying to change people's behavior when they have major depressive disorder or anxiety disorders and so on. There are some types of brain functions where a pharmacological, a drug intervention can help. Uh, there are some disorders like schizophrenia, for example, where drug treatments are particularly effective for dealing with hallucinations and delusions because of what they do neurochemically. Anxiety can be allevi alleviated quickly by essentially increasing the amount of a neurotransmitter in your brain that inhibits activity in brain structures that lead you to feel afraid or anxious. But their effects are felt in the moment, and they don't last in the long term. As soon as you stop taking the medication, the effects go away. Because they're not fundamentally changing the connections among brain regions that give rise to your behavior, that make you who you are. And if you want to change that, the only way to do, through, do it is through changing the way people think, feel, and act by modeling the appropriate behaviors and doing it again and again and again. Um, that's really the only way. So if you actually, if you look at FDA-approved methods for treating depression, for example, there's something known as cognitive behavioral therapy, which involves having people get training in identifying their kind of maladaptive patterns of thinking about the world that lead them to feel depressed, and then getting them to systematically change those patterns of thinking slowly but surely over time. It turns out that cognitive behavioral therapy is at least as effective in the short term as is any type of drug regimen. But in the long term, it's much more effective in keeping you from sliding backwards because you've started to change the underlying brain representations that give rise to the depressive behavior to begin with. And, and when we talk about those gains, where do you feel they are in that scale between the short-term effect of pills and the treatment that you're talking about that is deeper? <laughs> I, I think the sky's the limit, frankly. I think it really just depends on the nature of the game. Um, what, pro what psychological processes is it engaging? What real world behaviors is it simulating and modeling? To the extent that a game environment is going to have a very close match to the behaviors in the real world you want to change, of course you're going to have a much greater chance of changing that real world behavior. Right? An example from research of the sort that I do. So I tend to study, I, I, my initial training was in doing very cognitive, sort of cold cognitive things, like studying memory and learning and attention and vision. But then I gradually I shifted to studying emotion and motivation and social behavior, in part because I recognized that most of the issues that people have, if they have issues functioning in their daily life, 
are about those abilities, not about how much information you can hold in your mind for a short period of time. And uh, my lab studies empathy. We study how to change people's capacity to regulate their emotions, to find positive meaning in a negative experience. It helps you keep moving forward despite a setback and so on. It turns out that's a vast vista of uh, training that's been relatively unexplored except in clinical contexts. But it turns out, for example, if you take someone with autism who's got severe deficits in understanding that other people have a mind, have internal thoughts and feelings and wants, and that's why we do what we do, and you give them training in very simple static tasks that don't really mimic how I try to understand your behavior or the, audi or the audience's behavior, or my wife's behavior, or my children's behavior in real life. I may give you, for example, photographs of facial expressions of emotion. For a long time, this was taken as a pretty reliable measure of how good you are at understanding other people's emotions. But is a static, sty stylized, black and white photograph of a person posing a smile or a frown or looking afraid, really how we recognize people's emotions in daily life? No, it isn't. Right. And you can train people with autism to get really good at recognizing these static facial expressions. But then if you ask, does that transfer to daily life and improve their daily functioning, it, it doesn't. Better is if you actually give them, and there are some school systems that institute different kinds of actual interpersonal interaction where you're training people in real time, giving them feedback to model the actual behaviors with another person who's sharing, this is what I'm thinking or feeling right now, or a third person is helping model the behavior you want the person to exhibit, where you're taking into account the fact that human social behavior dynamically changes over time. It's often subtle, it's often uh, the combination of different cues, so the arch of an eyebrow and the tilt of a head in one context means someone is intrigued and interested, but skeptical and dismissive in another. Right. And being able to pick up that subtle difference is something we're probably most of us good at as adults. But in order to train someone to get better at that, you're not going to do that through reading a text. You're not going to do that through... Um, showing them static pictures of just the eyes. That's another test that's been used in the literature that's kind of ridiculous at some level. So, so you, what, after we talked and before, yeah. the, before this conversation, I know that you went and looked more into the literature thus far, and you know, we can agree that it's early. You know, this, this is pretty young. But you looked at some of the literature about games, you know, from the brain games that actually get a lot of criticism. I'm, you know, I'm not going to mention the name of the company to things that are a bit more robust. And what do you see? What do you see most of the focus is on, you, you mentioned kind of two domains, the social emotional or the more cut, you know, like the cold cognitive one. It's almost 100% on the cold cognitive side. Um, by and large, uh, the basic science research on training the brain, if you will, or changing behavior, uh, for a long time was on trying to change learning ability, to change memory ability, to change your ability to selectively attend to one thing and ignore distractors. That's called executive control. Um, the ability to hold information in mind and manipulate it. Like if I give you a phone number, 74853740, right? Trying to keep that in mind. I, if I ask you to give it to me backwards, being able to manipulate those digits in mind and reverse the order. All of that is thought to rely on executive control. It's lateral towards the outside regions of your prefrontal cortex. We've um, studied them for a long time. And the brain training literature, although it's been fairly controversial, it's maybe on the behavioral side, it's even 15 and 20 years old. But the number of papers on it has ramped up exponentially in the last few years, especially in the last five years. And now people looking at changes in the brain that go along with brain training. The best read that I have of that literature is that if you train people in these kind of executive control tasks that are thought to tap into the fundamental cognitive processes that underlie behavior in a lot of different domains, but again, it's the cold cognitive side of behavior, um, you can get people better at those tasks. You can change their behavior by up to, say, a standard deviation. Like, if this is the average, you can move them up to a standard deviation, but often about a half a standard deviation. Um, there's some controversy as to whether younger or older adults show bigger effects. At one point, we thought it was older adults because they started off from a place of deficit and had more room to get better. Now, there's more recent research that suggests younger adults might have bigger benefits because that kind of prefrontal machinery is more intact in them. And 
uh, can kind of start gaining benefits from training more rapidly. Um, but the real question is, to what extent does training on the thing I had you do, that I'll say the name of the company, Lumosity, right? I know some of those people. Um, <laughs> for better or for worse. <laughs> Um, it's not recorded, right? <laughs> recorded. I don't care. I don't do design games. I just do the science. Right. Um, I can get away with saying what I want, I suppose. Um, uh, you know, the bottom line is basically um, you can get transfer. The real question is if I want to say I'm going to change your life right. by performing these games, are we really changing fundamental abilities that will stave off the onset of Alzheimer's and dementia and so on? The jury is still out on that. Right. Like, there's been a lot of, Lumosity got a lot of criticism and a fine from the FDA because of claims they made about the ability to stave those off. There just isn't credible data on that yet. But there is credible data, so far as I can see, that training on these games makes you better not just at those specific tasks, but it transfers a bit. There's sort of near transfer, a task that's pretty similar to the one I trained you on, just a little bit different. Yeah. So, you, so these are the games. But then that, there's the far transfer question. Right. Does it move to something that ostensibly taps into the same fundamental processes, but on the surface, the surface features of the game are totally different? The evidence is that some cases yes, some cases no, but the amount of transfer is about half or a third the magnitude of the benefit you got just right. from training on a specific task. Right. So, but again, just to mention, put a plug in for studying the social and, and emotional side. There's very little, very little on that. And, and it sounds like, in your belief, it's, it's not that only that it's missing, it's a big opportunity. Because, it's a huge opportunity. Because it could affect health as well as I think everything else. If you look at virtually every psychiatric disorder that um, has been described by uh, medicine, the vast majority of them feature Emotion, dysregulation, and problems with interpersonal behavior as cardinal features of the disorder. And often, they're the ones that cause the biggest problems in functioning and getting along with people in your everyday life. It turns out even if you look at the effects of just brain damage, right, the parts of the brain that subserve emotion, if they're damaged, they will have a more profound impact on your daily life in many ways than will damage to parts of the brain that cause you to be unable to read, to recognize faces, even to move. Um, to remember things for short or long periods of time. Because the affective and social machinery of the brain is what shapes your personality. It makes you who you are. It's your sense of humor. It's the arch wit that you might have, the way you interact with your spouse and your children and your friends. You're more likely to get divorced and lose your job after damage to the parts of the brain that um, are some sort of emotion and social function than you are uh, damage when you suffer damage like to other function. parts of the brain, other kinds of functions. Right. And yet, you know, I've done surveys of people, and they almost never rate social and emotional function as the things they least want to lose on a list of all these different abilities and faculties we have. They always list the cold cognitive stuff and speaking and things like that as most right. important. But people get by much more easily without those than without the emotional stuff. OK. Uh, so the, the other, the other uh, thing that, you, that when we spoke about, to me, related, was very related to games. You spoke about, uh, in terms of kind of brain training and learning, almost kind of two systems. Again, we're simplifying things, but you know, one that you call Lassie, and <laughs> one that you call the absent-minded professor. Sure. And I thought that it, it could align very well to how we see good games affect, affect us, or actually in both, right? So can you tell us more about that? Sure, absolutely. So, um, uh, psychologists and neuroscientists often uh, try to use sort of simple metaphors for describing why we do what we do. And uh, one really useful metaphor is in terms of um, humans having sort of two modes of behaving. One is sort of being a creature of habit. And I use Lassie, if you know who Lassie is from the old TV show, <laughs> uh, as a kind of prime example of what it's like to be a creature of habit. You can learn to kind of pursue a goal, learn a pretty complicated behavior, learn to adapt to obstacles in the pursuit of that goal, and be somewhat flexible in the pursuit of that individual goal. Um, you can learn to do it pretty automatically in a way that's not very reflective, and be pretty good at it. 
Turns out the brain, that's the, probably the source of most of our intelligence. You can process tremendous amounts of information in parallel in a kind of non-conscious, automatic way that's the seat of this sort of ref, like driven by the environment, processes triggered by the environment that help us read, help us drive a car, help us play sports, and have many other habits of mind and emotion as well that are part and parcel of our everyday life. A lot of the things that you get better at when you become a better writer or a better coder and so on become automatic ways of thinking and approaching problems that are this all part of this habitual Lassie mode of behaving. But the limitation on this sort of Lassie mode is that when the world doesn't quite fit the expectations we've habitually learned to have, you need something more. And that's where the absent-minded professor mode of behaving comes in. When something kind of goes awry, when there's errors, something that doesn't quite make sense, this other mode of being reflective, thinking and paying attention in the moment, holding things in conscious awareness, pushing them around, solving a problem, reasoning in that way, um, where when you have the full attention of this professor part of your, or your mode of behavior, you can do a lot. You can think through very complicated problems in an analytic way where you have the features of the problem in mind and you're solving them. Right. But there's a limitation because when you get stressed, when you get distracted, when you get tired, when you're hungry, when your blood sugar is low, when other people are pulling your attention this way and that, that absent-minded professor that's fundamentally limited in terms of the amount they can hold in mind gets pulled this way and that and falls apart. Right. And the trick is to kind of have those two modes go hand in hand. Probably most of the time we're going on this, in this habitual mode of behaving, at least 90% of our behavior is controlled by that. And you have to be really careful what you tend to think repeatedly, what attributions you make about are you good at this? Are you not good at this habitually? What are other people like? Because those habits of thinking about yourself or other people, about your limitations or lack thereof, tend to become ingrained and in habits pretty quickly. Right. And, and I thought about it, obviously, in, in, this, in the uh, context of games, in that a game designer is teaching you certain things to do. Absolutely. You become pretty good at them uh, quickly, and they become automatic for you. But in certain type of games, you need the other meta reflection thinking to solve more complex problems. And, some, and in many games, they go together. You have all those things that you learn and you keep doing casually, and then you have kind of those moments when you need to really solve something uh, more complex. We have five minutes, so maybe I'll take one question from the audience. Someone has a, a burning Um, so the question is, uh, what other techniques are there out there for kind of identifying and tracking brain function in real time? So um, you know, EEG, which measures uh, uh, electrical activity in parts of the brain that are pretty close to the skull, um, has been around for a long time, and there's a lot you can do with it. It turns out, however, that there's some brain structures that EEG can't pick up because they're too far away from the cortical surface. Just Coincidentally, the brain structures for emotion and social behavior tend not to be very close to the cortical surface. They're buried down and deep. Um, uh, there's something called uh, sort of near-infrared spectroscopy, where you can sort of basically uh, use light to kind of look directly through the skull at changes in blood flow on the cortex underneath. That's pretty good if what you want to do is track changes in blood flow right underneath that are right underneath the cortex. And for, this is another reason why cognitive training has tended to be what people focus on, because a lot of the brain regions involved in uh, cognition in a cold, like can I do a problem and so on, are close to the, they're right under the skull. It's lateral prefrontal cortex and your parietal lobe under the parietal bone of your skull up here. The social and emotional stuff is you're not gonna reach using EEG, not reliably. Um, you're not gonna reach using these other techniques that kind of try to look through your skull. Um, there are other things that are kind of far-fetched right now, um, but that's kind of what we have right now. Um, so maybe maybe we'll use kind of the last uh, uh, this last couple of minutes to.
again, it's obviously a teaser and it's obviously a very short conversation, but maybe some conclusions, some takeaway, you know, from everything we, you looked at, from our conversations, where do you think we are with cognitive training and, you know, using it in games? And where do you see, you know, the, where is the uncharted territory? Where is the place that you would like to see more of that? Or you think there is an opportunity? So, uh, I mean, that's a great question. I mean, as somebody who's sort of an observer of this area and who studies certain kinds of training, one I've already mentioned many times is studying the social and emotional aspects of behavior and having games that embody them and change them. Right. Because they're often the source of interpersonal conflict, intergroup conflict, uh, demagoguery, taps into all that kind of stuff, and so on. That might be relevant in this silly political season. Um, uh, but uh, you know, there's another, I want to put in a plug for the, the one limitation of things like lumosity in these brain games is the tasks themselves are relatively kind of stripped down and simplistic. Narrow. They're very narrow, exactly. And the games that seem to be hitting more pay dirt are the ones that require you to navigate two different kinds of information at once and switch between them which requires not just switching between tasks as if that's a cold cognitive thing, but it requires motivationally assessing how relevant is it? How much, you know, what's the value of doing this versus that right now? How excited am I about shifting to this other task versus this other one? Am I feeling frustrated or not? There's an untapped affective dimension and motivational dimension to what's going on that is absolutely essential to higher executive functioning. Like executive control is not dry and cold and emotionless. It's all about that. It's all about prioritizing what I should pay attention to. Like attention doesn't just happen because there's, you know, like the movie Inside Out tells us, four or five little people inside your head telling you what to do, right? It's because your emotion and motivation systems of the brain are directing you to pay attention to things. So, so you're feeling that, I mean, you're, you know probably that in those pre prioritization processes, unlike a computer that doesn't have any emotion involved in the, you know, making processes fast, I mean, deciding which one to go for, here there is actually an emotional and social relevance because we're humans and multitasking and prioritizing has to affect that. Absolutely, multitasking is at least, just to pick a number, 40 or 50% about affect regulation, emotion regulation at the same time. Because you start to feel stressed, you start to feel like things are slipping beyond you. When do I shift from this to that? To what extent can you keep your cool while you're trying to do these different things at the same time? To what extent is your motivational system really sensitive to the reward of be getting better at this task? All of those things, that the cognitive training literature has treated as sort of noise to be ignored, right. I'm going to bet are going to turn out to be major signal that should be tapped into. And it's, a, it's an uncharted territory there. OK, great note to end on. Uh, thank you all that you joined us. Hope it's a good uh, entry to the, to the track and that uh, it gives you appetite for more. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you.